we got uh, Dr. Dan uh, Sado from uh, King's Hospital. He's a co consultant cardiologist for heart failure and uh, cardiac MRI. Thanks very much. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Perfect. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to uh, speak. So we've got quite a mixed audience uh, in terms of what you will have seen with MRI. And what I've tried to do with this talk is try and pitch it so that there's something here for everybody. So some stuff that's very basic uh, for what we do in MRI and some stuff uh, that's more advanced. This will be similar to the previous talk as lots of different case examples to try and illustrate the points being made. So if you go back maybe 20 years, um, the previous talk you had was basically what, what you had, uh, if you like. So echocardiography was by a country mile and remains the dominant imaging modality in cardiology. And you saw you can do a huge amount of stuff with it. And for many things we need in inherited heart disease, it will answer many of the questions that we have. That was fine, but one of the main limitations was tissue characterization of the myocardium, where ECHO struggles a little bit more uh, with uh, in terms of trying to look at it in detail and trying to look at, for example, scarring. You can see wall thinning, but it's very difficult to actually image scar uh, using ultrasound based techniques. And that's really where MRI became of interest. But it took a long time. I mean, people were scanning knees and heads long before they were scanning hearts in an MRI scanner. So the question is, why did it take so long? Is it because nobody thought the heart was very interesting? I suspect nobody will think that on uh, on this uh, course. Cardiologists already got the info they needed from existing tests. Well, we discussed that actually a lot of the information need the answer to that is yes, but not entirely. Unique physics properties in MRI which challenge us when we scan the heart, which is the answer to this question. Uh, and then uh, one from my registrar at the time uh, who said cardiologists already had a magnetic personality or electrophysiologists didn't like the ECG quality uh, from inside the magnetic field. So the issue that we had is that the heart moves with respiration and intrinsically. So you had to find a way to get information quickly. So many of you on uh, on this course would have had an MRI scan as some bit of the body. And if it wasn't the heart, for example, say you were having your knee scanned, you might run a sequence that takes three minutes. No problem. As long as you can keep your legs still for three minutes, we'll get a beautiful picture of your knee. Clearly, you can't hold your breath for three minutes unless you're a deep sea diver. And even then you may struggle a bit with it. So we had to try and find a way to get the information we needed very quickly. So it required much more uh, sort of challenge, if you like, or it resulted in much more challenge in terms of uh, what we needed from our medical physicists and sequence developers to try and get us the information we need much quicker. And that's why it took longer for cardiac MRI to become mainstream. Now that it has, now, this is not to say that my unit is representative of all units around the country, but it gives you some idea of what I would call our unit a sort of medium to high throughput service. If you look at what goes through an MRI scanner now, about 30% of our scans are normal. If you look at inherited heart disease, it's yeah, around about sort of seven or eight percent of what we do. Now, our inherited service isn't massive. And since I did this, which is about three years ago, this graph's about three years old. Actually, inherited service got bigger. My suspicion is that graph will probably be or that bar will probably be up here now. And of course, some of these DCMs actually probably actually belong in the inherited uh, group as well. So you can see it's a huge amount of, if you look at what these things all are, a huge amount of this is heart muscle disease work of which inherited heart disease is a big bulk of that. So really a lot of what we do is based around inherited. What are the problems? Claustrophobia with bigger scanners and we can scan people on their front rather than on their back. Um, you sure generally will find most claustrophobic patients will get through the scan. If you're very, very claustrophobic, uh, you may struggle. Temporal resolution is not really a problem in inherited disease, but if you want to study something like endocarditis where you've got uh, sort of small structures that are flicking about, that's much more difficult uh, because the temporal resolution of the te technique is not so good. The spatial resolution is good, so you get beautiful image quality uh, in terms of seeing the structures, but fast moving small objects very hard. Patients with renal failure, 
actually many of them we now do give contrast to and there's more and more evidence that probably the risk is negligible if any uh, in doing that cost is often debated it's much more expensive than echo but it's a whole lecture in itself to debate uh, cost of mri asthma with adenosine uh, usage if you've got severe asthma you have to be careful using adenosine for heart stress again that's not a particular problem in inherited uh, cardiomyopathy we don't often use adenosine we sometimes we do in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy but the many of our scans we don't need it in inheritors so it's not a major issue if we can't use it availability is a problem around the world not in the uk we have very wide availability some ferromagnetic objects struggle a bit in the scanner it may be that actually they're safe but they cause a load of artifact uh, um, or it may be that, for example, there sometimes you can have metal fragments in the eyes. It just means you can't have a scan. So what would a typical study involve? The first two points really give you anatomical imaging, which I'm going to show you. We then do cine imaging, which basically looks like the echo images that you've just seen in the previous talk. And then the last bit is late enhancement imaging, which we'll discuss. Now, there's a whole load of other things we may choose to do as well, but a typical study is those four things often with some additions to it. So here's some anatomical imaging. Uh, you're looking at transverse set of images here. So this is the front of the patient. This is the back of the patient. That's the vertebra there. That's the right lung, left lung. We'll go through it again here. This is the liver, so in the abdomen coming up into the chest. Here's the heart descending aorta. And you sometimes pick up pathology when you do these sorts of images. So here for the more advanced uh, members of the audience, this was a patient a young chap who presented uh, with myocarditis, troponin rise, acute chest pain, uh, and had uh, myocarditis when we looked at his heart. But he has a very interesting cause of that. And it has been written up. Uh, we actually wrote this case up. There's been a series of these cases actually written up subsequently or possibly even before by Oxford on this. And what you're seeing here is a funny looking mass in here which you very easily confuse with bowel. It's sort of sitting just under the liver here. And this is actually a pheochromocytoma. Um, so this is an adrenaline secreting tumour from the adrenal gland here. And that was why he had uh, myocarditis. So the anatomical imaging in one or 2% of scans actually can be extremely helpful. So here we have our cine imaging. So this is akin to what you were seeing on echo. This view is not, you can't get, whoops, you can see, just move through there. You couldn't get that view on echo, but those were the long axis views. These are the short axis views. So on echo, typically you take three slices through. So it might be this one, this one, and this one. MRI, you get lots of slices through. What you're seeing here, the bright stuff is the blood pool. The darker stuff around here is the left ventricular myocardium contracting. This is the right ventricle on this side. So you see here the wall of the right ventricle is much thinner than all the left ventricle. The stuff in here is the papillary muscles. So of course, when you're doing things like ejection fraction, it's really easy to do because you can see when you draw, you end up drawing circles around this in diastole and a circle around it in systole and the computer then works out for you uh, what the ejection fraction is based on the difference between the two. What about late enhancement? So gadolinium uh, is an extracellular tracer we give intravenously. It collects where there's more extracellular volume in the body. So it will get outside of capillaries, but it won't get inside cells. You get more of it where there is higher amounts of extracellular volume. And that might be from collagen in fibrosis, from edema or infiltration. And really that's the cornerstone of what MRI brought to the table originally. It's why it became very popular. And for those of you who like graphs here, you're comparing time with the amount of contrast. So if you give contrast into normal myocardium, you get shed loads going quickly and it leads very qu leaves very quickly. In an infarct or in any area of scar, it goes in more slowly, but sticks around. It can't get out so quick. And you can then do some imaging that brings out the difference in the amount of contrast between the normal myocardium and the abnormal myocardium and what that will look like on an image potentially is like this so here we have a three chamber view this is the left ventricle here the gray stuff in the middle here is the blood pool this is the aortic valve mitral valve left atrium aorta this is the septum and you see here it's bright white and it just stops there and then this is all black this is all normal this has all taken up a shed load of contrast. This is a massive left anterior descending myocardial infarction. 
the differing patterns of this can give you a lot of information about what the underlying pathological process is. So here, patient with myocarditis, the inner layer is spared, the subendocardium. This is all epicardial based scarring, which is classic of what we see in myocarditis. We're going to talk about sarcoid and amyloid a bit later on. So that's a bit of background around what we do with MRI. What about the bulk of the talk, which is about inherited heart disease and MRI? So things you might want to know, making a diagnosis, where can we be helpful? It might help you make a diagnosis. We might help you look for complications of the diagnosis. You may already know what the problem is, but you want to see whether the patient develops a specific complication. We may help you with prognostic information and we may help guide treatment. Ultimately, number four is the aim of the game. You want to do something that's going to impact patient treatment in a beneficial way. So here's a 31 year old who's presented with VT while cycling, no family history of inherited heart disease. His right ventricular end diastolic volume index is 120 mils per meter squared. That is mildly elevated and his right ventricular ejection fraction is 32%, which is low. And the question is, what's the diagnosis? And really the giveaways in the four chamber view here. So this is the right ventricle in here, left ventricle, septum, lateral wall, left atrium, right atrium, which when it stops playing, that's irritating. Uh, I don't think it will start playing again now. Let me just try. No, so basically what you saw here is this is a dilated right ventricle that doesn't contract as well as it should. The ejection fraction is low. Some of it contracts better than other bits. So there's regional wall motion abnormality. You can't see now because it's not playing, but this area was contracting better than this area. This is arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. This is classic arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. He actually, I didn't show you this, he actually has a bit of scar in the lateral wall. So again, moving away from the idea of ARVC, there's left ventricular involvement as well here. This is a poor 38 year old patient of mine who presented with horrendous shortness of breath. I uh, actually admitted her from clinic, this lady, um, when I first met her. Uh, she couldn't get from the clinic room to the consulting room uh, without looking like she was going to keel over, bless her. So she had a family history of dilated cardiomyopathy in a first degree relative. I'm, just, again, I'm sorry it's uh, stopped uh, playing. The question is, what's the diagnosis? And what you saw on this when it was playing was a ventricle that was contracting very poorly and is very dilated. And this is dilated cardiomyopathy and almost certainly is going to turn out to be inherited. What's interesting with her is that with medical therapy, her heart has completely transformed. I was very surprised by this. I thought we were going to end up needing to go down a transplant route with this lady. I mean, she presented so bad, she left, left bundle branch block. In fact, with medical therapy, her EFs improved from 22 to 44. And you can see here the ventricle is smaller and contracts much better now. So she's clearly far from normal, but actually has really responded very well to medical therapy. Here's a 42 year old family history of DCM, normal ejection fraction and volumes when you measure them. And the question is, what's the diagnosis here? And what you're seeing here, the myocardium here is very thin. And then you've got all of this trabeculation at the apex coming up here in the anterior wall. This is a two chamber view. So that's the left atrium, left ventricle. And here is the inferior wall. All of this trabeculation really is pushing you heavily. I mean, this is this is really gross trabeculation. Trabeculation is a really difficult area. Um, trying to make a diagnosis of non-compaction can sometimes be difficult. This is as bad as it gets, really. So this is left ventricular non-compaction, no question. You can try and make a science of it and measure the wall thickness and compare that to the amount of trabeculation. If ratio is above 2.3 of uh, normal, normal myocardium to trabeculation, that's how one might classify non-compaction. That's easily going to be the case in this particular case. So this is a non-compaction and you can see there's a family history of DCM. And then the last of the cardiomyopathy is a 50 year old male hypertension family history of sudden death, normal ejection fraction when you do the numbers, in fact probably it's going to be super normal I expect. Wall thickness of 25 millimeters in the septum, what's the diagnosis? And this is classic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. You've got really gross asymmetrical septal hypertrophy here. The septum here is really thick. Look how thin the lateral wall is in comparison. So really impressive HCM. So what else can we do on MRI and HCM? So we can show you a picture like that. 
we already knew on that particular case clearly from echo what you were going to see so the mri shows you a very nice picture of it but it doesn't tell you anything new sometimes things can be more difficult so a lot of what we do in talks is show you really impressive examples of things actually quite frequently referrals to me are mild lvh bit of hypertension possibly a bit of family history type thing is this hcm or hypertension that's the cause and sometimes it's very very difficult because you end up with a wall thickness that might be 13 14 millimeters so it's sort of a bit gray zone there are things on mri you sometimes see that can help you with this so quite often patients with genetic disease are a little bit more trabeculated at the apex quite often they have clefts and crypts away from the inferior basal inferior wall they may have elongation of the mitral valve leaflets and the papillary muscles may be abnormal as you saw in the previous talk so all these things actually come out really nicely on mri and if you're really not sure they can be helpful if you don't see any of this it doesn't mean it's not hcm but it pushes you a little bit more towards hypertension whereas if you see all of this you're much more pushed towards saying this is probably more likely to be hcm Sometimes you can get unusual forms of hypertrophy that are more sort of localized. This was an interesting case. This was actually back when I was doing my PhD. So Echo actually missed this. There's a really abnormal ECG in a patient with family history. And what you're seeing here is that there's really impressive hypertrophy of the anterior wall. And actually you do see it on Echo. And I'll come onto this point at the end of the talk. You do see it on Echo. But it was so odd. I think probably the sonographer thought they were they had an odd cut and that it wasn't actually pathology that was being seen. So it's easy when you look at it on here to see that this area is really abnormal. Uh, but if you did a two chamber view, which would be a cut that would come through here, if you're a little bit off axis with it, you might just catch it. And I remember looking at the echo thinking, I know that I could see this is abnormal, but it's not as impressive as what you're seeing here. So I can sort of see see how it happens. It's of course MRI, if you like, gets you out of jail a little bit in a case that's a bit odd. Uh, like this. Sometimes you have apical predominant HCM. So here you can see the apex of the heart is very thick, much more impressively so than the more basal bits. And again, often echo will have already told you this. It all depends on echo how you've cut it. So if you get the probe in the right place on the chest here for an apical view, you'll go nicely through that and you'll see it beautifully. If the probe's a little bit further around, and that's just unlucky if that's the case, if your nice image happens to be more through here, you may only just catch it and it may not be quite so obvious. Most of that, I have to say, certainly at King's, my previous job at the heart hospital, the majority of apical cases we saw in MRI uh, had been picked up on echo previously so it's unusual that you pick this up unexpectedly unless it's mild it's the, the really mild stuff is obviously more difficult so and the last thing and this is a still image but sometimes we can be helpful for guiding myectomy so in the end for myectomy often you're going to take a piece of tissue from the sort of basal anteroceptum and so we can sort of show you say in this case here is quite thick there some patients with HCM, that area is a bit thinner, which of course gives you an increased risk of causing a VSD uh, in that area. So sometimes it can be helpful for the surgeon to actually look at the anatomy with the lots of cuts we get here through the short axis in detail. Last thing with HCM is the area of real debate, which is what's the use of late enhancement. If you have a shed load of late enhancement, lots of late enhancement, it's a risk factor for developing more burning out disease. There's no question around that. So lots of scarring in the heart means you're more likely to end up burning out and ending up with a more dilated uh, phenotype. The interesting question is whether it's actually a risk factor for sudden cardiac death and there's sort of conflicting data around this and whether we should be using it as a risk factor and I think certainly for me and what I see a lot of units doing with this are for patients where you're a bit borderline if they've got a lot of scar you're generally pushed towards an ICD. Some places in the States for example a little bit more pushy uh, with using late enhancement uh, as uh, as a risk factor the amount of late enhancement um, uh, for ICD decision making. So phenocopies, last bit. Uh, is, here's, a late, here's a 6 year old lady who presented with breathlessness and you can see has a ECG with LVH and some ST and T wave change. And on echo, this was a long time ago, this case, and actually this case means a lot to me because my PhD was built around this case as it as it ended up happening. I didn't know that at the time, but it was a pivotal case actually for me. This it was an apical hypertrophy. This looks like apical HCM. And you put the patient in the scanner and it's quite thick at the apex. So there's a little crypt in there. That's what they look like on MRI. So it looks like apical HCM. And we get contrast. We see contrast in the basal infralateral wall, which is a bit unusual in apical HCM. Normally you wouldn't see that. 
and we were and the reason why it was of interest to me during my PhD, we were doing something called T1 mapping where we were looking at this T1 is a magnetic property uh, in an MRI scanner and we were looking at measuring it in the myocardium and normal myocardium using the sequence we we're using looks green. In this particular patient, it was very blue. So the T1 signal was low. Something inside the myocardium was impacting the T1 signal in a way that HGM normally wouldn't. And if you look at this graph, low T1 signal in patients with LVH is very suggestive of Anderson Fabry disease, a fat storage uh, problem, sphingolipid problem. And that's what this was. This turned out to be uh, Anderson Fabry disease. Now it'd be unusual to pick it up that way in today's world because we often test patients for it anyway uh, before they would have to get to an MRI scanner, but that's what it was. Here was a patient of mine who unfortunately did very badly, presented with uh, shortness of breath, mild LVH. There was an original question I remember with him around whether he might have HCM. When we gave him contrast, the blood pool here is jet black, the subendocardium here is white, the mid wall black, and the RV side of the septum bright. And this is classic of what you see in amyloidosis. So in amyloid, nor the other late enhanced images you've seen, you may not have noticed the blood pool would have been very bright. There's lots of contrast in the blood because you've given the injection uh, of gadolinium into, uh, into a vein. In amyloid, there's so much extracellular space expansion in multiple organs in the body, it just sucks the contrast out and so the blood pool just looks black. You get this classic zebra stripe pattern in the myocardium, so he unfortunately died not long after this scan was done. This, this was a rather classic case of somebody who was thought to have had apical HCM came to us and I remember when we put him in the scanner and we did this image and thought this looks a bit odd because you don't see any cavity in here at all. It looks just, I mean you can see why it was originally thought to be apical HCM, it's very very thick and in fact when you give contrast you see it's jet black here so this has taken up no contrast at all, this is all clot. So this is a patient who's actually got hyperosinophilic syndrome. So such patients sometimes, I haven't shown you this, but they get, as, as this patient does, has late enhancement in the subendocardium here, it becomes very sticky. And so all this thickening actually is thrombus, it's not actually myocardium. And then I think the last uh, phenocopy case, this was one who was referred to me with uh, potentially ARVC with ectopics. And I'm sorry, the movie doesn't play with this, but the, you see the right ventricle is big. So, I thought be ARVC. What was odd when we did T2 assessment, now T2 shows you inflammation. <clears throat> Normal T2 should look very purple with the sequence we're using here and you see this is all very bright. So there's a lot of very high inflammatory signal, that's very odd uh, for ARVC. Sometimes we would see it in arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, sometimes you can get hot arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathies, but this is already a bit odd for that. When we give contrast, we see some subendocardial contrast. That would be extremely odd for arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy here and here. And then a load of enhancement on the RV side of the anteroceptum and all around the RV. This was actually sarcoidosis. And what's interesting with him is all of this T2 signal work got better with six weeks of prednisolone. The right ventricle didn't get better. It was scarred. So this was inflamed. The right ventricle was scarred. So the right ventricle stayed as it was. The left ventricle got better and all the ectopics went away, interestingly, with the steroids. So last bit, last slide here is this is all well and good. And I think one of the key things to remember with this, however, is we can show you lots of interesting stuff. Inherited imaging is actually hard. And you always got to think, we can show you what these techniques can do, but ultimately in your own hospital, how good these techniques will be will come down to a series of things. The ability of your referrers. So do they send you the right sorts of things? So you're going to drive your stress echo department mad if everybody you send them is 180 kilos, for example. You're going to drive us mad if everybody you send us is horrendously claustrophobic uh, sort of thing. Physics of the technique, you know, you're never going to use MRI to look at problems with the lungs. You know, CT is just going to be better. Echo is going to be better than us for endocarditis. We're going to be better than echo tissue characterized. You know, there are some things that are just inherent to the techniques that will always be this way. The equipment you use is the MRI scanning that you're using something that belongs in a museum or did you buy it yesterday and it's a state of the art bit of kit. It's going to determine to some extent how good what you produce is, how good are the people doing the scan, your radiographers and your sonographers, the ability of the people reporting the scan. And then what is the department like? What's the leadership, management and team ethic of those delivering the care like? Those things are all key to this. And what you find, and I put this at the bottom here, 
many inherited consultants are also CMR trained to a high level because actually it's not easy to do this. You need a deep understanding of inherited heart disease to report these scans well. And if you look at Brian, but he's highly trained in, in both. Uh, if you look at uh, the department that I work with at GSTT, Rachel, Nabil, uh, Hannah, Gerardo, all, uh, Jerry, all highly trained in MRI uh, as well. Sanjay Prasad, you know, the, the, the list goes on. Lots of people have combined these two um, because they, they sort of, they lend themselves well to each other. Uh, and it's just, it's just a key bit of being able to understand inherited disease. You know, you need to be good at imaging and, you know, to be good at imaging and inherited, you need to be good at inherited, if you like. So. I hope that was useful and uh, thank you so much for asking me to speak. Thanks very much, Dan. Um, tremendous talk as always. Thanks very much. Um, hopefully you can stick around and um, yes, there are um, a couple of interesting cases coming up.